This is the Gibson Jumbo. It was built in 1934 and it's one of the very first sloped shoulder dreadnoughts. It was a radical departure at the time. Take a look at the L3 from 1924. This was built during the Lore era, era. It was a high point for Gibson and it was a novel and standard guitar of the time. The size, the volume, the projection, and everything was designed to compete with the Martins of the same era, and they were pretty much the same size. But over a short 10-year period, everything changed. World War I ended uh, in 1918 and was followed by the Roaring Twenties, and this broad expanse of jazz, mandolins and Banjos were slowly drifting out of fashion. And then the crash of 29 hit and brought the Great Depression. Um, this pretty much reached every household and every wallet by 1933. Then this guy appeared. Um, first, a little sidebar about Martin. Martin had built guitars for other companies, uh, even producing some radical designs that were a bit too much for Martin to put in their own, under their own name. Uh, Martin was always a traditional company and really slow to change with the times. As early as 1916, the large music distribution and retail company, Oliver Ditson Company, wanted a bigger guitar for a market that they, they believed was definitely coming. Um, they conceived a giant guitar. They wanted the biggest, the loudest, the most prominent, the best. They convinced Martin to build it, and they wanted to call it the Dreadnought. The name, of course, came from the HMS Dreadnought, a battleship built in 1906, and it was the largest warship ever built at that time. It seemed appropriate for a new guitar. Uh, the first ones they tried had fan bracing, of course, which couldn't take the tension of steel strings. So they modified the bracing, worked with something they had developed in the late 1800s, X-bracing, and they finally came up with something which worked pretty well, all still under the Oliver Ditson name. Uh, it was quite a while before they actually saw that the market was there, as Oliver Ditson had forecast, and they finally put their own name on it uh, in 1931. They released, this is two Martin models, a D1 that was mahogany and a D2 that was made out of rosewood. They also called it the Dreadnought, and they reshaped it to be what is known as a square-shouldered Dreadnought, where the shoulders of the guitar come in at 90 degrees to the neck. Gibson was not about to be outdone, and even though the Depression had suppressed kind of all retail sales at the time, uh, Gibson introduced this guy in 1934, and this is actually one of the very first. It was sunburst on the sides, on the back, and on the top. Mahogany back in size, uh, Adirondack spruce top. Gibson had decided to name the guitar the Jumbo. It was 1934 and the name Jumbo was familiar as the famous elephant of the barnman Bailey Circus whose shoulders stood 13 feet high above the ground, the shoulders. Uh, he was well known all around the world. He was even one of the 21 elephants that marched across the Brooklyn Bridge when it first opened to try and convince the public that it actually was safe. Uh, the Gibson Jumbo was four and a half inches deep and of uniform depth, a 16-inch body, 14 frets clear of the body, a fixed pin bridge, and a compensating saddle. The soundboard is almost the exact same area in square inches as the Martin, but the shoulders don't actually come into the neck at 90 degrees, and so to differentiate it, they refer to it as a soft shoulder, coming in at a little less. But the waist is narrower than the dreadnought, which meant that this large guitar sat a little lower on your leg, letting your arm sit a little lower, and it was a bit more comfortable as a consequence. It positioned Gibson well to compete with the new Martin dreadnought, and by golly, it did. 
The Jumbo itself was only in production between 1934 and 1936. And then they, they changed it to the advanced jumbo uh, and the J35 both released in 1936 both very very similar shapes slightly less depth slightly different uh, uh, X bracing pattern and different decorations the advanced jumbo was the more expensive for the two at the time it was going for around $85 and the J40 uh, J35 was going for around $35. The Martin D28, which it was called by that time, was going for a little over $100. So Gibson was competing in every way that they could. Later, the Jumbo 35 was replaced by the J45 in August of 1942. And that J45, one of the most popular guitars ever produced, is still in production today, pretty much the way we, we've come to know it. Um, on the fancier end, satisfying the needs of the singing cowboys of the silver screen, in 1937, Gibson decided if a big guitar was a good idea, then a bigger one was an even better idea. So they started producing uh, what they called the J200. Now, remember the J series here, J35, 45, and the J200 uh, all refer to jumbo. These became known as the SJ for Super Jumbos, 200s. Uh, the body was now 18 inches in the lower bout, competing in size with the largest arch tops of the day. This also was followed by a J100, slightly less decorated and a little more, and a little more affordable. But it all started, it all started with this guy, the very beginning, the very DNA of what we now think of as a large-bodied flat-top guitar. Leonard Wyeth for AcousticMusic.org.